Well, this is really, um, can you hear me all? This is really uh, quite a panel to be a part of. The three amazing talks that uh, came before this, so um, I'll do my best to, uh, to keep it up. In the short bit of time that I have, I'll try to provide some sense of an answer for the question on the screen here. And I'll begin to do so through a series of, of case examples. And the first will uh, come from Isle Royal National Park, where I've spent some time, uh, a couple of decades or more, uh, studying the wolves and moose that live there. And the point that I would like to make can be illustrated through this uh, time series. So wolves are being shown in the red, uh, moose are in the black. It's about 60 years worth of data there. And I want to add a few bits of additional information to the graph to help us interpret and understand what's going on. In the early 1980s, a disease came to Isle Royale and was implicated in that large decline in wolf abundance. It was a canine parvovirus was the disease. It was brought to Isle Royale inadvertently. A little while later, there was a, a severe winter, not just like any old kind of severe winter, but like a once in a century kind of a severe winter. And that was implicated in that decline of moose that you see there. A little while later, what had happened, maybe before you read the words on the slide, you can hear me just give a short uh, preamble to it all. Um, over this time period, the climate's been warming. Over the same time period, the frequency of ice bridges has been declining. And for several decades, the frequent formation of ice bridges is what allowed for wolves to occasionally come to Isle Royale. That's what had, for several decades, staved off any adverse effects of inbreeding depression. With climate warming, the bridges became less frequent. Inbreeding took its hold, and through uh, genetic markers, we can kind of mark, essentially, that point in time for like the, the well, that's when things started to unravel. And then, in just last year, the National Park Service began efforts to restore wolf predation on Isle Royale. So we can take these 60 years, and we can divide them up into four periods of time. And we can start to now think what is a little bit more traditional kind of thoughts for uh, population biologists, which is to ask questions about predation rate. So predation rate is uh, it's a statistic that's very simply the percentage of the moose population that's killed by wolves in a particular year. It's a useful indicator of basically just the strength of the top-down pressure on a prey population. And so for this first period of time, the average predation rate in a particular year, or in any year during that period, was about 11%. And then after the disease came, and even though the disease only did its thing for a few years, but for more than a decade afterwards, the predation rate had dropped to less than half, or approximately less than half. Severe winter comes along, and then the predation rate more than doubles. And then uh, genetic deterioration takes hold, and then predation rates drop to just about 2% for this period of time. So we can identify two large blocks of time for which the top-down pressures were pretty strong, and we can identify two periods of time for which that was not the case. Now, of course, I'm a population biologist, and one of the things that population biologists like to do are to build models to explain statistics. And so I spent a little bit of time thinking about how can we build a statistical model that would help explain predation rate. We have a lot of information at our resources to be able to do that, wolf abundance, moose abundance. Uh, climatic variables, um, all sorts of things. The very best model that we can put together, the most parsimonious model that we can put together for explaining predation rate is a model that simply is mindful of what point in time in history are, we are in. That explains 60% of the variance in predation rate. And so keep in mind that most of these events that seem to have triggered the system switching from one to the next, first of all, they're very disparate, they're very different kinds of events, and every one of them was entirely uh, unpredicted. Finally, we didn't really begin to develop this sense of what's happening on Isle Royale until about this time, about 2010. So it's not as though like we knew that this is how it was playing out all along. This is something that we've come to understand rather late in the game. Okay? And so, a couple answers to the question. What happens when wolves inhabit or re-inhabit a landscape? Sometimes their influence is top-down, and strongly so. Sometimes it's not, and we usually can't tell until long after the fact. Second case example comes from the elk herd that lives in the northern range in the northern part of Yellowstone National Park. And this one, just because my time is short, I'm, I'm afraid I won't do quite as good a job at it. You'll get, you'll get the sense of it, and if you were interested to get a richer sense, these papers would, would guide you well, I think. This is a time series of elk abundance going back to the 1920s, all the way up to the present day. This is the time in which wolves were reintroduced. And of course, everybody's really keen to note that the population started declining right afterward. It's important to know that for this period of time marked in blue, there really was a very aggressive um, 
harvesting plan that was implemented during this time, and it had a rather explicit aim of reducing elk abundance. And in the years that followed wolfer introduction, that's exactly the time in which the harvest rate was, was ramped up at its highest levels. And I, I think it's fair to say the harvest worked because the elk population started to decline. I was a lead author on a paper that indicates for approximately the first decade after wolves arrived, the primary causes of decline were climate and hunting. It's really not credulous to think that wolves had any significant influence during this period of time at all. The predation rates were on the order of one or two percent during this period of time. For what might be called very roughly the second decade post reintroduction, what seems to impress the folks who are studying Yellowstone wolves today is how difficult it is to disentangle the effects of the different predators that, that are there. It's, it's, as I understand it, it's reasonably, uh, it's, it's appreciated that predators are what's uh, really driving things for this last 10 years in time, but it's, it's quite difficult to disentangle it, whether it's grizzly bears, mountain lions, or wolves. So, what happens when wolves re-inhabit a landscape? Prey abundance fluctuates. It does so in response to fluctuations in habitat quality, climate, hunting and predation. That's what happens before wolves are on the landscape, and that's what happens after wolves are on the landscape. So my previous two examples are uh, small study sites uh, studied in great, great detail. Uh, the next kind of case example that I would like to make would be the entire state of Idaho. Um, so this is a time series of wolf abundance in Idaho, starting from uh, when wolves were first reintroduced there all the way up until 2015, uh, approximately 800 wolves at that time. It's at about the time that they changed their hunting method, but if you look at um, Idaho Fish and Game's webpage right now, it says that the current unofficial estimate is over a thousand animals. So this is a uh, you know, large increase in the number of wolves. This is roughly where wolves live in Idaho, the gray area. And just earlier this year, the Idaho Fish and Game uh, published a press release. And the press release was a uh, 2019 outlook on elk and uh, deer hunting. And so I'll focus on the elk parts. And um, what I'll show you next are excerpts from that press release. You can uh, look it up on yourself uh, pretty easily on the internet. And, and, the, and the excerpts are, they really and truly are representative of the report on the whole. Hunting should see, hunters should see good to excellent hunting for elk. Uh, uh, yeah, good to excellent hunting for elk. The state is meeting or exceeding its elk population goals in 17 of 22 elk zones. Elk hunting is good. It's been good for a number of years, and that's not expected to change. The 2000 elk harvest, 2018 elk harvest ranks among the top 10 all-time elk harvests. Harvest has exceeded 20,000 annually for the last five years, which has not happened since the all-time high harvest between 1988 and 1996, which of course is just before wolves showed up on the scene. If you scan this report, you will find exactly zero mentions of the word wolves in the report. It doesn't show up at all. There is, in this report, I don't know how long it is, it's probably like 800 words or 1,000 words long, there is exactly one reference to predation, to uh, cougar predation. What it's mostly filled with is references to climate and changes in habitat quality. And, and lastly, it's not as though things are s just a perfectly static sort of hunting utopia. Uh, there are changes, um, and this is represented by this quote from the press release, like elk, hunters have adapted and shifted hunting efforts towards areas where herds are thriving rather than areas that drew many elk hunters in the past. So things certainly change and certainly at, at regional, regional kind of scales. So what happens when wolves inhabit or re-inhabit a landscape? I, I think a case could be made, even though I focused on Idaho, that in all six states where there are really sizable wolf populations, hunting thrives. Now what I want to do is sw switch gears a little bit, start talking about case studies, places, and talk about an idea. And the idea has to do with trophic cascades, or what probably would be a little bit more properly referred to as the less sexy, but probably more useful description of just indirect effects of wolves. And so this is a paper published in 2014 in the journal Science. It was accompanied by uh, really kind of, an, I think, an important figure. And the figure shows very simply, but it's worth just saying the words, that if wolves have an effect on elk, and if elk have an effect on the vegetation, well, vegetation is going to have an effect on an awful lot of stuff. Ergo, the indirect effect of wolves must be quite large. That's the basic idea. And when it shows up in a journal like this, it's accompanied with a figure legend that's got a really no less than about eight or ten scientific references that would indicate exactly what each one of those arrows represents. 
But of course, good scientists, at least I think good scientists, are interested in, in making their results uh, known and accessible to a wider audience. And some of the authors of this paper were involved with, and I applaud them for this, um, for making, in, or I shouldn't say making, but helping develop more artistic and more um, accessible representations. And these are institutions who made this diagram, Oregon State University and the National Park Service. These are organizations that care deeply about getting the message right. And I don't know, I think they probably did a fine job. And of course, in this particular case, there's a great deal of focus on riparian ecosystems. Kind of accompanying this sort of a, of a visual, there's a YouTube video that's been around for a little while now that's called How Wolves Change Rivers. It's received more than 40 million views. More recently, in fact, this is just a year ago, there was a paper published in a peer-reviewed journal, and the paper was really a, about this picture. I think the picture came first, because there was good reasons to think that the picture was useful, but there's a really nice paper that came out just a year ago. It's published in this journal, and I have to move over here so I can read this a little better. There's a little glare here. So results are consistent with a landscape scale trophic cascade whereby reintroduced wolves operating in concert with other large carnivores appear to have sufficiently reduced elk herbivory in riparian zones to initiate the recovery of riparian plant communities and stream channels. That's the concluding sentence of the abstract for that paper. A year later, a journalist, I, I think a respectable journalist, uh, published a paper online and cited a couple of other scientists and this is what one of the other scientists said about this idea. Not so much about this particular, particular paper or this particular picture, but about the idea. It's a lovely story, and I would love this to be true, but it isn't, it's demonstrably false. Another scientist in the same article says, this is a really romantic story, it's a story about a world that doesn't exist. If you wanna know where those quotes came from, you could type those words into the internet, the name there is the name of the journalist, and that's when the article was published. I intentionally didn't put the names of the scientists up there. They're all good scientists. I respect every one of them. And you can easily find out who they are if you don't already know who they are. But here's the point that I want to make, because I have a question that I'm after. What happens when wolves re-inhabit a landscape? Scientists write stuff, and they disagree about it, and they do it in view of the public. Okay? Every bit of that is Beautiful, that's exactly how it should be. Scientists writing stuff, disagreeing about it, and doing it in public view, it's all great. But that it gets done in public view probably requires some considerations that aren't made often enough. And, and I have a rather specific concern in this particular case. When wolves re-inhabit a landscape, it's, it's my belief anyways, that it deserves a public justification because not everyone likes it. And it doesn't mean that that public justification is something that everyone has to rally around and become a steward behind the idea. But it should be a reasonable idea at least. Even maybe if we're fortunate to be even reasonable in the eyes of people who might even disagree with it. As I understand it, the most common public justification that I hear is that wolves have these massive system-wide ecosystem impacts. Please, for a moment, put yourself in the mind frame of a person who's maybe a little skeptical of all of this. I think one of the things they'd be wondering, and you're the same people telling me wolves aren't supposed to be back for elk hunting? I can reconcile those two ideas, but I, you know, I have a PhD in population biology and study this sort of thing all day long. I think for people who may be opposed to wolves or just skeptical of the reasons that are being offered, those are two ideas that are oft repeated and they're a little hard to reconcile. Well, all right, some things are just hard to reconcile. But in the, I'm actually drifting from my main point because here's my main point. This justification, the second green box, that justification, it rises and falls with every scientific paper that reinforces or detracts from that claim. Now, wolves, it's said, are sometimes symbols. And sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it is, it's a distracting thing, but it is a thing. And one of the things that I think think of wolves when they're being used as symbols, is that they're sometimes symbols for our relationship with nature on the whole. How it is that we love them, love nature, and how it is that we hate it. And that makes me think about the biodiversity crisis, because recovering wolves isn't about just wolves. It's about the biodiversity crisis on the whole. And if arresting the biodiversity crisis depends on recognizing the usefulness or benefits of a species, 
I think we know how that plays out. That's not a recipe for arresting the biodiversity crisis. That's what caused it. And so I think there's an alternative explanation. And we heard it expressed beautifully just a couple talks ago and expressed in, in my own words. It's that humans were wrong to extirpate wolves and it's important to right past wrongs. Let's just consider that as a candidate justification because it might not be a good idea. One critique of it would be, well, that's a very nice sentiment. Sounds like something you might hear from the humanities department. But there's no way that you could, not even social scientists would say that, right? Humanities <laughs> department. There's no way you could take that idea and build policy on it. I would beg to differ. All you need to do is to read the preamble of the United States Endangered Species Act. If you read the preamble of the Endangered Species Act, it's only a few paragraphs long. And if you have that idea in mind about writing past wrongs, you'll know that is exactly the purpose of the Endangered Species Act. Maybe you'll concede. And then you might say, yes, but that's not a really good reason for like regular folks. That's just a little like too artsy or something like that. I'm reminded all the way back to 2001, Bermejo Ranch, there was a meeting, this is in northern New Mexico, a meeting 18 years ago to talk about whether it would be a good idea to bring wolves back to the southern Rockies, which meant northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. And that meeting had a lot of technical stuff. It was primarily, if not exclusively, populated by professionals of very, very various kinds. And there was an opportunity for uh, people to get up to a microphone and just say what it is that they thought might be really important considerations in moving forward. And I really, I've exhausted every bit of my memory of that meeting except for one quote. There was one fellow who got up there. By his appearance, he looked to have deep, deep concerns about ranching and livestock. And he said one sentence and then sat back down. And this is what he said. He said, God put wolves here. The government took them away. And you have to figure out which side you're going to be on. I believe that was a cowboy's way of expressing the same idea. And so I, <laughs> I think it's an idea that has a, a more than enough flexibility to carry us far down the road. So, and I think this is my last slide here. What we need, or what happens when wolves re-inhabit a landscape is that we need better accounts of why. We need better accounts of why it is that we should restore wolves, why it is that we should hunt wolves, because that happens next. And if you're interested in some of my thoughts on that, you can check out that paper or talk that I give tomorrow afternoon. We need better accounts of what the goals are and why those are appropriate goals wolf abundance, if you think like the number of wolves is an integral to a uh, goal for wolf recovery, you might want to study the history of Wisconsin. They leaned pretty hard on that and they, they still kind of wrestle with that a little bit. Is it fair compensation programs? Okay, very fine. Why would some particular compensation program be fair or not? Minimize social conflicts? Why? Sometimes this just means making quiet the noisiest people. Sometimes this means paying special attention to a disenfranchised group. And so there needs to be a little bit more um, sophistication about answering what, figuring out what these goals are and why. Now, we have wolves in about a dozen states. And Colorado may be soon added to those ranks. I think Colorado can do better than all of those other states on answering these questions why. And it's not because of something fundamentally wrong with those other states. It's because answering the question why is really hard. Thanks so much.